my India, arise. The longest night seems to be passing away. Awake from this hypnotism of weakness. Stand up and assert yourself. Proclaim the God within you. Religion alone is the life of this country. When that goes, India will die. In spite of politics, in spite of social reforms, in spite of everything. Each soul is potentially divine. The goal is to manifest the divinity within all of us. Do it either by work or worship, by psychic control or philosophy, by one or more or all of these, and be free. This is the whole of religion. Doctrines or dogmas, rituals, books, temples, forms are but secondary details. Do you feel that millions and millions of descendants of gods and sages have become next door neighbors to brutes? Do you feel that millions are starving today and millions have been starving for ages? Your ancestors have written a few philosophical works, penned a dozen or so epics, or built a number of temples. That is all. And you rend the sky with triumphal shouts, while those whose heart's blood has contributed to all the progress that has ever been made in the world, well, who cares to praise them? Ye ever trampled laboring classes of India, I bow to thee. For the next fifty years, let all other vain gods disappear from our minds. This is the only god that is awake, our own race. The first god that we have to serve and worship are our own people. Everywhere his hand. Everywhere his feet. He covers everything. Sarvatokshi shiro mukham Sarvata shutimal loke Sarvamavritya tishthati Faith. Faith in ourselves. If you have faith in the 330 millions of mythological gods and still have no faith in yourselves, there is no salvation for you. Let us all work hard, brethren. This is no time to sleep. On our work depends the coming of the India of the future. It was here in the city of Calcutta that Swami Vivekananda or Narendranath was born on the 12th of January, 1863. Not far from the holy river Ganga, in this house and its neighborhood, the boy Naren used to play as a child, like other children. His father, Sri Vishwanath Datta, was an attorney of the Calcutta High Court, well versed in Persian and English literature, but typical of his time. His father was indifferent to the Indian cultural heritage, but his mother, Srimati Bhuvaneshwari Devi, belonged to the old Hindu tradition. Religious by temperament, she would often read to the boy tales from the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. This was the seed of spiritual life sown early in Naren's mind. His boyish imagination was fired by these tales of heroic idealism. Ram Chandra going to the forest in exile, renouncing his kingdom to keep up the promise of his father. Jatayu, the eagle king's self-sacrifice to rescue Sita. Bharat's devotion to his brother in exile. Krishna and Arjun in the battle of Kurukshetra, mother of the universe, goddess Durga. One day he purchased a little image and took it quietly up into the attic. A frantic search was made for the missing lad, when at last he was discovered here, sitting self-absorbed before his Ishta, chosen deity. Those days in gentlemen's homes one would come across these separate hookahs or hubba bubbles for the different castes and for the Hindus and the Muslims. Naren was curious, and one day he took some whiffs from the hookah marked for people of the lower caste. 
Then he tried, one after the other, the hookah for the Brahmins and the hookah for the non-Brahmins. Men are all alike. Then why are their hookahs different? Thought the young ascetic. What are you doing there, Naren? Oh, father, I'm just trying to find out how one loses caste. But I can't really find any difference. Oh, you devil! So the boy grew up into a brave and brilliant, intellectually alert young man. Reverend Hasty, the principal of his college, who had taught Norin, had this to say about him. I have travelled far and wide, but I have never yet come across a lad of his talents and possibilities. He is bound to make a mark in life. Words that would one day come true. In his student life, he came in contact with the Western intellectual tradition through the works of Kant, Hegel, Hume, and Herbert Spencer, to whom he had once written a letter. The scientific ideas and nihilistic thoughts of Western thinkers shook to their foundation the religious beliefs he had inherited. They raised such a tumult in his mind that he despaired of any final answer. Raja Ram Mohan Rai, the founder of Brahmo Samaj, had broken away from the rituals, the image worship and the priestcraft of Orthodox Hinduism. As an intellectually alive young person, Norin could not but be interested. He had joined the Samaj partly because of his sympathy with its program of social reforms. But this did not satisfy his deeper spiritual yearnings. Of a strong, positive cast of mind, he wanted to see the truth, face to face, and not merely hear talks about it. In those days, Keshav Chandra Sen was a renowned orator and religious leader of the Samaj. There were also men like Vijay Krishna Goswami, Shivnath Shastri and others. They all spoke of a merciful God and delivered sermons learned and beautiful to hear. But Norin's hunger remained. The doubts lingered still. Does God really exist? If so, has he form? Or is he formless? Can he be seen? How? In his agony and despair, Norin went round the leaders of different sects in the city and its suburbs. He had a single and straight question. Have you seen God? Have you seen God? Have you seen God? But none could answer. At last he thought of going to Maharshi Devendranath Thakur, the venerable leader of the Brahma Samaj. Narendranath was then staying in a houseboat on the Ganga. There went Narendranath unannounced. At the time, the Maharshi was in deep meditation when Narendranath suddenly pushed open the door and stood before him, agitated but respectfully. Sir, have you seen God? No, my boy. But you have the eyes of a yogi. You should practice meditation. If a person like the Maharshi could not give a positive answer, then who could? Was there anything in religion after all? Obstinate questionings wrecked his youthful soul. But soon, relief would come from unexpected quarters. After a few days, one of his cousins who had been watching his movements, Ramchandra Dutto, told Noren, Noren, if you really wish to lead a spiritual life, you should go to Sri Ramakrishna at Dokineshwar. What? You ask me to go to that illiterate priest of Kali? What does he know? I have read Kant, Hegel, Hume, Spencer, and you now ask me to go to a man who does not even know how to write his own name. But Narin, what is the harm in a visit? Ramchandra said. Even if you do not like the man, you may like the place. Argument indeed. <laughs> 